Welcome to Data Science and Introduction. I'm Barton Polson, and what we're going to do in this course is we're going to have a brief, accessible, and non-technical overview of the field of data science. Now, some people when they hear data science, they start thinking things like data and think about piles of equations and numbers and then to throw on top of that science and think about people working in their lab and they start to say, that's not for me. I'm not really a technical person and that just seems much too techy. Well, here's the important thing to know. While a lot of people get really fired up about the technical aspects of data science, the important thing is that data science is not so much a technical discipline, but creative. And really, that's true. The reason I say that is because in data science, you use tools that come from coding and statistics and from math, but you use those to work creatively with data. The idea is that there's always more than one way to solve a problem or answer a question, or most importantly, to get insight. Because the goal, no matter how you go about it, is to get insight from your data. And what makes data science unique compared to so many other things is that you try to listen to all of your data, even when it doesn't fit in easily with your standard approaches and paradigms. You're trying to be much more inclusive in your analysis. And the reason you want to do that is because everything signifies, everything carries meaning, and everything can give you additional understanding and insight into what's going on around you. And so in this course, what we're trying to do is give you a map to the field of data science and how you can use it. And so now you have the map in your hands and you can get ready to get going with data science. Welcome back to Data Science and Introduction. And we're going to begin this course by defining data science. That makes sense. But we're going to do it in kind of a funny way. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the demand for data science. So let's take a quick look. Now, data science can be defined in a few ways. I'm going to give you some short definitions. Take one on my definition is that data science is coding, math, and statistics in applied settings. That's a reasonable working definition. But if you want to be a little more concise, I've got take two on a definition that data science is the analysis of diverse data or data that you didn't think would fit into standard analytic approaches. A third way to think about it is that data science is inclusive analysis. It includes all of the data, all of the information that you have in order to get the most insightful and compelling answer to your research questions. Now, you may say to yourself, you know, wait, that's it. Well, if you're not impressed, let me show you a few things. First off, let's take a look at this article. This says data scientists, the sexiest job of the 21st century. And please note that this is coming from Harvard Business Review. So this is an authoritative source and it's the official source of this saying that data science is sexy. Now, again, you may be saying to yourself, sexy, I hardly think so. Well, oh yeah, it's sexy. And the reason data science is sexy is because first it has rare qualities and second, it has high demand. Let me say a little more about those. The rare qualities are that data science takes unstructured data, then finds order, meaning, and value in the data. Those are important, but they're not easy to come across. Second, high demand. Well, the reason it's in high demand is because data science provides insight into what's going on around you. And critically, it provides competitive advantage, which is a huge thing in business settings. Now, let me go back and say a little more about demand. Let's take a look at a few other sources. So for instance, the McKinsey Global Institute published a very well known paper and you can get at it with this URL. And if you go to that webpage, this is what's going to come up. And we're going to take a quick look at this one, the executive summary, it's a PDF that you can download. And if you open that up, you'll find this page. And let's take a look at the bottom right corner. Two numbers here. I'm going to zoom in on those. The first one is they are projecting a need in the next few years for somewhere between 140 and 190,000 deep analytical talent positions. So this means actual practicing data scientists. That's a huge number. 
but almost 10 times as high as 1.5 million more data savvy managers will be needed to take full advantage of big data in the United States. Now, that's people who aren't necessarily doing the analysis, but have to understand it, who have to speak data. And that's one of the main purposes of this particular course, is to help people who may or may not be the practicing data scientists learn to understand what they can get out of data and some of the methods used to get there. Let's take a look at another article from LinkedIn. Here's a shortcut URL for it. And that will bring you to this webpage, the 25 hottest job skills that got people hired in 2014. And take a look at number one here, statistical analysis and data mining, very closely related to data science. And just to be clear, this was number one in Australia, in Brazil, in Canada, in France, in India, in the Netherlands, in South Africa, in the United Arab Emirates, in the United Kingdom, everywhere. And if you need a little more, let's take a look at Glassdoor, which published an article this year, 2016, and it's about the 25 best jobs in America. And look at number one right here, it's data scientists. And we can zoom in on this information. It says there's going to be 1700 job openings with a median base salary of over 116,000. And fabulous career opportunities and job scores. So if you want to take all of this together, the conclusion you can reach is that data science pays. And I can show you a little more about that. So for instance, here's a list of the top 10 highest paying salaries that I got from US News. We have physicians or doctors, dentists and lawyers and so on. Now if we add data scientists to this list using data from O'Reilly.com, we have to push things around the side. And it goes in third with an average total salary, not the base that we had in the other one, but the total compensation of about $144,000 a year. That's extraordinary. So in sum, what do we get from all of this? First off, we learned that there is a very high demand for data science. Second, we learned that there's a critical need for both specialists, those are the sort of practicing data scientists, and for generalists, people who speak the language and know what can be done. And of course, there's excellent pay. And altogether, this makes data science a compelling career alternative and a way of making you better at whatever you're doing. Back here in data science, we're going to continue our attempt to define data science by looking at something that's really well known in the field, the data science Venn diagram. Now, if you want to, you can think of this in terms of what are the ingredients of data science. Well, we're going to first say thanks to Drew Conway, the guy who came up with this. And if you want to see the original article, you can go to this address. But what Drew said is that data science is made of three things, and we can put them as overlapping circles because it's the intersection that's important. Here on the top left is coding or computer programming, or as he calls it, hacking. On the top right is stats or stats and mathematics or quantitative abilities in general. And on the bottom is domain expertise or intimate familiarity with a particular field of practice, business or health or education or something like that. And the intersection here in the middle, that is data science. So it's the combination of coding, and statistics and math and domain knowledge. Now let's say a little more about coding. The reason coding is important is because it helps you gather and prepare the data. Because a lot of the data comes from novel sources and it's not necessarily ready for you to gather. And it can be in very unusual formats. And so coding is important because it can require some real creativity to get the data from these sources to put it into your analysis. Now, a few kinds of coding that are important. For instance, there's statistical coding. A couple of major languages in this are R and Python, two open source free programming languages. R is specifically for data, Python's general purpose, but well adapted to data. The ability to work with databases is important too. The most common language there is SQL, usually pronounced SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, because that's where the data is. Also, there's the command line interface, or if you're on a Mac, people just call it the terminal. The most common language there is bash, which actually stands for born again shell. 
And then searching is important and regex or regular expressions. While there's not a huge amount to learn there, it's a it's a small little field. It's sort of like super powered wildcard searching that makes it possible for you to both find the data and reformat it in ways that are going to be helpful for your analysis. Now let's say a few things about the math. You're going to need things like a little bit of probability, some algebra, of course, regression, very common statistical procedure, those things are important. And the reason you need the math is because that's going to help you choose the appropriate procedures to answer the question with the data that you have. And probably even more importantly, it's going to help you diagnose problems when things don't go as expected. And given that you're trying to do new things with new data in new ways, you're probably going to come across problems. And so the ability to understand the mechanics of what's going on is going to give you a big advantage. And the third element of the data science Venn diagram is some sort of domain expertise. Think of it as expertise in the field that you're in. Business settings are common. You need to know about the goals of that field, the methods that are used, the constraints that people come across. And it's important because whatever your results are, you need to be able to implement them well. Data science is very practical and it's designed to accomplish something. And your familiarity with a particular field of practice is going to make it that much easier and more impactful when you implement the results of your analysis. Now let's go back to our Venn diagram here just for a moment. Because this is a Venn, we also have these intersections of two circles at a time. At the top is machine learning. At the bottom right is traditional research. And on the bottom left is what Drew Conway called the danger zone. Let me talk about each of these. Stuff, machine learning or ML. Now you think about machine learning and the idea here is that it represents coding or statistical programming and mathematics without any real domain expertise. Sometimes these are referred to as black box models. They kind of throw data in and you don't even necessarily have to know what it means or what language it's in and it'll just kind of crunch through it all and it'll give you some regularities. That can be very helpful, but machine learning is considered slightly different from data science because it doesn't involve the particular applications in a specific domain. Also, there's traditional research. This is where you have math or statistics and you have domain knowledge, often very intensive domain knowledge, but without the coding or programming. Now you can get away with that because the data that you use in traditional research is highly structured. It comes in rows and columns is typically complete and is typically ready for analysis. Doesn't mean your life is easy because now you have to expend an enormous amount of effort in the method in designing the project and in the interpretation of the data. So still very heavy intellectual cognitive work, but it comes in a different place. And then finally, there's what Conway called the danger zone. And that's the intersection of coding and domain knowledge, but without math or statistics. Now, he says it's unlikely to happen. And that's probably true. On the other hand, I can think of some common examples what are called word counts, where you take a large document or a series of documents, and you count how often each word appears in there, that can actually tell you some important things. And also drawing maps and showing how things change across place and maybe across time. You don't necessarily have to have the math, but it can be very insightful and helpful. So let's think about a couple of backgrounds where people come from here. First is coding. You can have people who are coders who can do math, stats, and business. So you get the three things, and this is probably the most common. Most of the people come from a programming background. On the other hand, there's also stats or statistics. And you can get statisticians who can code and who also can do business. That's less common, but it does happen. And finally, there's people who come into data science from a particular domain. These are, for instance, business people who can code and do numbers, and they're the least common. But all of these are important to data science. And so in sum, here's what we can take away. First, several fields make up data science. Second, diverse skills and backgrounds are important and they're needed in data science. And third, there are many roles involved because there's a lot of different things that need to happen. We'll say more about that in our next movie. The next step in our data science introduction and our definition of data science is to talk about the data science pathway. So I like to think of this as when you're working on a major project, you got to do one step at a time to get from here to there. 
In data science, you can take the various steps and can put them into a couple of general categories. First, there are the steps that are involved planning. Second, there's the data prep. Third, there's the actual modeling of the data. And fourth, there's the follow up. And there are several steps within each of these. I'll explain each of them briefly. First, let's talk about planning. The first thing you need to do is you need to define the goals of your project so you know how to use your resources well, and also so you know when you're done. Second, you need to organize your resources. So you might have data from several different sources, you might have different software packages, you might have different people, which gets us to the third one, you need to coordinate the people so they can work together productively. If you're doing a handoff, it needs to be clear who's going to do what, and how their work is going to go together. And then really to state the obvious, you need to schedule the project so things can move along smoothly, and you can finish in a reasonable amount of time. Next is the data prep, where you're taking like food prep and getting the raw ingredients ready. First, of course, is you need to get the data and it can come from many different sources and be in many different formats. You need to clean the data. And the sad thing is this tends to be a very large part of any data science project. And that's because you're bringing in unusual data from a lot of different places. You also want to explore the data. That is really see what it looks like, how many people are in each group, what the shape of the distributions are like, what's associated with what. And you may need to refine the data. And that means choosing variables to include choosing cases to include or exclude making any transformations to the data you need to do. And of course, these steps kind of can bounce back and forth from one to the other. The third group is modeling or statistical modeling. This is where you actually want to create the statistical model. So for instance, you might do a regression analysis, or you might do a neural network. But whatever you do, once you create your model, you have to validate the model. You might do that with a holdout validation, you might do it really with a very small replication if you can. You also need to evaluate the model. So once you know that the model is accurate, what does it actually mean? And how much does it tell you? And then finally, you need to refine the model. So for instance, there may be variables you want to throw out, there may be additional ones you want to include, you may want to again, transform some of the data, you may want to get it so it's easier to interpret and apply. And that gets us to the last part of the data science pathway. And that's follow up. And once you've created your model, you need to present the model because it's usually work that's being done for a client could be in house could be a third party, but you need to take the insights that you got and share them in a meaningful way with other people. You also need to deploy the model, it's usually being done in order to accomplish something. So for instance, if you're working with an e commerce site, you may be developing a recommendation engine, that says people who bought this and this might buy this, you need to actually stick it on the website and see if it works the way you expected it to. Then you need to revisit the model, because a lot of times the data that you worked on is not necessarily all of the data. And things can change when you get out in the real world, or things just change over time. And so you have to see how well your model is working. And then just to be thorough, you need to archive the assets document what you have and make it possible for you or for others to repeat the analysis or develop off of it in the future. So those are the general steps of what I consider the data science pathway. And in some what we get from this is three things. First, data science isn't just a technical field, it's not just coding things like planning and presenting and implementing are just as important. Also contextual skills, knowing how it works in a particular field, knowing how it will be implemented, those skills matter as well. And then as you got from this whole thing, there's a lot of things to do. And if you go one step at a time, there'll be less backtracking, and you'll ultimately be more productive in your data science projects. We'll continue our definition of data science by looking at the roles that are involved in data science, the way that different people can contribute to it. That's because it tends to be a collaborative thing. And it's nice to be able to say that we're all together working together towards a single goal. So let's talk about some of the roles involved in data science, and how they contribute to the projects. First off, let's take a look at engineers. 
These are people who focus on the back-end hardware, for instance, the servers and the software that runs them. This is what makes data science possible, and it includes people like developers, software developers, or database administrators, and they provide the foundation for the rest of the work. Next, you can also have people who are big data specialists. These are people who focus on computer science and mathematics, and they may do machine learning algorithms as a way of processing very large amounts of data. And they often create what are called data products. So a thing that tells you what restaurant to go to, or that says you might know these friends, or provides ways of linking up photos. Those are data products, and those often involve a huge amount of very technical work behind them. There are also researchers. These are people who focus on domain-specific research. So, for instance, physics or genetics or whatever. And these people tend to have very strong statistics, and they can use some of the procedures and some of the data that comes from the other people, like the big data researchers, but they focus on these specific questions. Also, in the data science realm, you'll find analysts. These are people who focus on the day-to-day -day tasks of running a business. So, for instance, they might do web analytics, like Google Analytics, or they might pull data from a SQL uh, database. And this information is very important and good for business. And so, analysts are key to the day-to-day -day functioning of business. But, you know, they may not exactly be data science proper because most of the data they're, they're working with is going to be pretty structured. Nevertheless, they play a critical role in business in general. And then, speaking of business, you have the actual business people, the men and women who organize and run businesses. These people need to be able to frame business-relevant questions that can be answered with the data. Also, the business person manages the project and the efforts and the resources of others. And while they may not actually be doing the coding, they must speak data. They must know how the data works, what it can answer, and how to implement it. You can also have entrepreneurs. So you might have, for instance, a data startup. They're starting their own little social network or their own little uh, web search platform. An entrepreneur needs data and business skills, and truthfully, they have to be creative at every step along the way, usually because they're doing it all themselves at a smaller scale. Then we have in data science something known as the full stack unicorn. And this is a person who can do everything at an expert level. And they're called a unicorn because truthfully, they may not actually exist. I'll have more to say about that later. But for right now, we can sum up what we got out of this video by three things. Number one, data science is diverse. There's a lot of different people who go into it. And they have different goals for their work, and they bring in different skills and different experiences and different approaches. Also, they tend to work in very different contexts. An entrepreneur works in a very different place from a business manager, works in a very different place from an academic researcher. But all of them are connected in some way to data science and make it a richer field. The last thing I want to say in data science and introduction where I'm trying to define data science is to talk about teams in data science. The idea here is that data science has many different tools and different people are going to be experts in each one of them. Now, you have, for instance, coding and you have statistics. Also, you have fields like design or business and management that are involved. And the question, of course, is who can do all of it? Who's able to do all of these things at the level that we need? Well, that's where we get this saying. I've mentioned it before. It's the unicorn. And just like in ancient history, the unicorn is a mythical creature with magical abilities. In data science, it works a little differently. It is a mythical data scientist with universal abilities. The trouble is, as we know from the real world, there's really no unicorns animals, and there's really not many unicorns in data science. Really, there's just people. And so we have to find out how we can do the projects, even though we don't have this one person who can do everything for everybody. So let's take a hypothetical case just for a moment. I'm going to give you some fictional people. Here is my fictional person, Otto, who has strong visualization skills, who has good coding, 
but has limited analytics or statistical ability. And if we graph his stuff out, his ability, so here we got five things that we need to have happen. And for the project to work, they all have to happen at at least a level of eight on the zero to 10. If we take his coding ability, well, he's almost there. Statistics, not quite halfway. Graphics, yes, he can do that. And then business, eh, all right, and project, pretty good. So what you can see here is in only one of these five areas is auto sufficient on his own. On the other hand, let's pair him up with somebody else. Let's take a look at Lucy. And Lucy has strong business training, has good tech skills, but has limited graphics. And so if we get her profile on the same thing that we saw, there's coding, pretty good. Statistics, pretty good. Graphics, not so much. Business, good. And projects, okay. Now the important thing here is that we can make a team. So let's take our two fictional people, Otto and Lucy, and we can put together their abilities. Now I actually have to change the scale here a little bit to accommodate the both of them, but our criterion still is at eight. We need a level of eight in order to do the project competently. And if we combine them, oh look, coding's now past eight. Statistics is past eight. Graphics is way past. Business, way past. And then the projects, there too. And so when we combine their skills, we are able to get the level that we need for everything. Or to put it another way, we have now created a unicorn by team. And that makes it possible to do the data science project. So in sum, you usually can't do data science on your own. That's a very rare individual. Or more specifically, people need people. And in data science, you have the opportunity to take several people and make collective unicorns so you can get the insight that you need in your project and you can get the things done that you want. In order to get a better understanding of data science, it can be helpful to look at contrasts between data science and other fields. Probably the most informative is with big data because these two terms are actually often confused. It makes me think of situations where you have two things that are very similar, but not the same, like we have here in the Piazza San Carlo in Turin, Italy. Part of the problem stems from the fact that data science and big data both have Venn diagrams associated with them. So for instance, Venn number one for data science is something we've seen already. We have three circles, and we have coding, and we have math, and we have some domain expertise that put together get data science. On the other hand, Venn diagram number two is for big data. It also has three circles. And we have the high volume of data, the rapid velocity of data and the extreme variety of data. Take those three V's together, you get big data. Now, we can also combine these two if we want in a third Venn diagram, we call big data and data science. This time it's just two circles with big data on the left and data science on the right. And the intersection there in the middle is big data science, which actually is a real term. But if you want to do a compare and contrast, it kind of helps to look at how you can have one without the other. So let's start by looking at big data without data science. So these are situations where you may have the volume or velocity variety data, but don't need all the tools of data science. So we're just looking at the left side of the equation right now. Now, truthfully, this only works if you have big data without all three V's. Some say you have to have the volume, velocity, and variety for to count as big data. I basically say anything that doesn't fit into a standard machine is probably big data. I can think of a couple of examples here of things that might count as big data, but maybe don't count as data science. Machine learning, where you can have very large data sets and probably very complex, doesn't require much domain expertise. So that may not be data science. Word counts, where you have an enormous amount of data, and it's actually a pretty simple analysis. Again, doesn't require much sophistication in terms of quantitative skills or even domain expertise. So maybe, maybe not data science. On the other hand, to do any of these, you're going to need to have at least two skills, you're going to need to have the coding, and you will probably have to have some sort of quantitative skills as well. So how about data science without big data? 
That's the right side of this diagram. Well, to make that happen, you're 